Morning Vineyard Boise. We're glad you're joining us this morning. My name is Mitchell. I'm the media director here. And I just want to share with you all the ways that you can engage in the service this morning. So we have three ways that you can engage. First is Facebook. Just head over to our Facebook page and you can watch live and interact with other members of the church as well as some of the leadership team. You can also start a watch party and share this service with all your friends and family. Make sure you're following the page so you'll get notified when we go live. Second is YouTube. YouTube makes it super easy to pull up the service on Apple TVs, Roku's, and smart TVs. Just open up the YouTube app and go to our channel and you're all set. This may be an easier option if you're wanting to watch just as a family or just not wanting to see the comments. Again, subscribe to our channel and you'll get notified when we go live. Third is our newest option at vineyardboise.org live. We've added a lot of new features to the live platform on our website to help you better engage. In addition to a great chat feature for the congregation, you can also ask for prayer from our leadership team and then pray with someone in the private chat window. There's also a built-in Bible and easy access to our devotions and some other great tools. Just go to vineyardboise.org slash live or click the watch live button on the website or the app. If you're new to Vineyard Boise, have questions, or want to connect with our leadership, we'd love to hear from you. Just fill out our online connect card at vineyardboise.org connect, and we'd love to get in touch with you. You can also ask for prayer by emailing prayer at vineyardboise.org. Enjoy the service. Welcome back. And uh, to those of you joining online, um, we're glad you're here. Uh, this morning, we are actually gathering in um, multiple environments. We're gathering on campus, uh, and so we've got some people joining here in the room. We've, other got peop- we've also got people gathering in homes, and so to those of you gathering in homes, welcome. We're glad you're here as well. And then we have other people who, um, who are gathering maybe um, also online, but maybe, com- maybe you're not watching with anybody else, joining with anybody else. And so uh, if that's you, we want to say that, that you're welcome here, and um, we're glad you're here. There's, we're, depending on which platform you're joining on, whether it's YouTube or, or Facebook or on the, on the website, um, there's uh, people you can interact with there. So be good to let yourself be known. But something we've been doing since the beginning of this, um, all this quarantine is just being intentional to light a candle wherever we are and to welcome God's presence. And so... This morning, what I'd like you to do is to, is to just pause as we begin to uh, just prepare for a time of worship and look around at the people around you. If you're joining on campus, if you just look at the people who've gathered to, uh, to worship together. And um, if you're at home, take a look around at the people on the couch, the people uh, sitting next to you. And, and if you're joining and there's, and there's no one uh, that you're with right now, maybe just let yourself be known to that uh, through the chat window or anything like that. And, um, and let's just pray for one another. Let's welcome God's presence uh, into this time. So Heavenly Father, we do, uh, we welcome your presence wherever we're gathered. Um, thank you that you have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that your presence is not attached to a building or to a campus or to a place. That wherever we go, that you are nearer to us than the very air that we breathe. So Lord, for those people that, that uh, are gathered around us, we ask for your blessing on one another. We ask for your presence to fill, to touch, to envelop one another. Fill our homes, fill our campus, fill this space, fill this time for your intentions. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are altogether good. And anything that you would have for us together today is to be welcomed because we can trust you. And so we say, we put our trust in you. We say, welcome. We pray that as we turn our our hearts and minds toward you in worship and in in your word, that we would be shaped by this this time together, this time with you, this time with one another. Shape us for your glory. Shape us for our joy. Shape us for the sake of a world that desperately needs your presence, your love, your redemption. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Hey, would you guys stand with us this morning? And uh, as I was as I was just praying about the service today and, and about our time together in worship, I just uh, I was prompted to read this prayer that Jesus actually prayed over us. And it's about the subject of unity. Jesus prayed this. He said, I ask not only for these disciples who he's with, but also for those who will one day believe in me through their message. I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you have given to me, I have given to them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You know, there's, there's some of us that are gathered here in the room today, and I have to say, I think I speak for the worship team as well. I just love to see your faces out there. Wow. Wow. It's beautiful. We've been, we've been uh, worshiping God in a, in a dark, empty room. So, man, this just reminds me of, of the beauty of community. And I know there's some of you guys that are, are joining us online today. Um, but wherever you are, there's an opportunity for us to be joined in unity. That was Jesus' prayer for us, that we be joined together in unity. And right now, we all know that there's just so many opportunities for disunity. And, and so the invitation, I believe, today is for us to come together and be united in, in our love for the Lord, to be united in our affection for Him, to be united as we lift our voices, as we hunger for His presence today. So I just invite you, um, let's just take one minute before we, we dive into the songs. And we, we don't wanna just do a song set. We wanna, we wanna worship the living God today. We wanna let Him lead us today. And so I just invite you to just whatever that looks like for you, whatever prayer is on your heart, to join with that prayer that Jesus had for us, that we would be unified. So Lord, we just thank you, Jesus, that you prayed for us, that we'd be unified, and we wanna step into that. God, would you do that? Would you produce unity in our hearts in this place today, um, in houses all over the Treasure Valley today? We are unified by our love for you. We are unified because you have rescued us. But help us to just see you in the midst of all the disunity and all the chaos, all the things that wanna divide us. God, we just say, we, we wanna be one. We are one because of you, Jesus, and what you've done. And so Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we come before you. We thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the unity that is available because of what you did and what you do. So Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, have your way today in this place. Have your way today in homes all across this valley. Have your way, Lord. We invite you. We welcome you. We long for you. We long to meet with you. We burn for you, Jesus. Come, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Unify our hearts, unify our hearts. With your spirit. There's 
nothing worth more. Cause there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Yes, you are. Your presence. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Tasted and see of the sweetest of love, when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your presence, Lord. Oh, we invite you, Holy Spirit.
voice let us become more aware of your presence let us the 
couldn't fill me. No, man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, put me back together, and put me back together. Every desire and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Just tell him. Oh, there's nothing, and nothing is better than you. Oh, we sing it again. Oh, and there's nothing, oh, better than you. Oh, there's nothing, better than you, God. There's nothing, nothing is. To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And still you call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better. to dancing and you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can I sing that again hey. you turn mourning to dancing you turn beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory Oh, you're the only one who You turn graves into gardens You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into army You turn seas into highways hear the voices and the drums this smoke oh yeah there's nothing You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies 
you turn seas into highways you're the only one who cares you're the only one who cares yeah there's nothing
to you, God. Yeah. We just sing that chorus. Let's sing, I will worship again. It's the voice of today. Can we, just, can we just lift praise to God? Can we just lift praise to God? God, we praise you in this place. We praise you in this place, Jesus. We praise you, God. You are worthy. You are worthy. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. I love worshiping with you guys. I love it. Hey, as you guys grab a seat, we've got some announcements uh, that are going to come on the screen. So uh, just give your attention to the screens and let's check out what's going on. Good morning, church, and welcome back to those of you who are finding a seat here in the sanctuary. Ah, so good to see happy faces in person. And a big hello to all of you that are streaming and finding a seat of your own wherever you happen to be this morning. And also a big shout out to our kids of the kingdom. What's up, guys? Mr. Jody and Kenny say hello. Whether you're here in person or you're just discovering our streaming service, if it's your first time, we want to connect with you through our virtual welcome center. You can fill out our online connect card and find out more information about what we're all about and learn about our kids ministry, youth group, celebrate recovery, arts ministry, food pantry, 
Yeah, we have a lot going on. Be sure to fill out the best way to contact you and someone will get in touch with you. Now, over the last few months, life has looked uh, different. We have all been challenged in just about every way. But no matter what the circumstances are that we face, one thing remains. There is a God who loves people and he's always by our side. As we create a new normal moving forward, some things will look pretty familiar and some things will look totally different. The good news is that we're moving ahead with eyes wide in hope and faith that God is using us to bless our neighborhoods. So about those things looking fairly normal, the Red Cross is still in need of blood donations and you can help. Come down to the gym on July 1st for the Red Cross Blood Drive. You can give blood from 1 to 7 p.m. Now, we recommend that you sign up at redcrossblood.org. You can just search by zip code and enter 83714. Movie night is back Friday, June 26th. Join us for a free outdoor movie night featuring Toy Story 4. We provide the movie experience on our giant 40-foot screen. We'll provide free activities and crafts for the kids. We've got free popcorn and water and glow sticks. Lots and lots of glow sticks. Be sure to bring your own blanket and or lawn chairs and feel free to bring any additional snacks that you'd like to have as well. The field will open at 8.30 p.m. and the movie will begin at sundown, which is about 9.30. Again, that is Friday, June 26th. Oh, and if you want to help volunteer, we always need volunteers. You can just go to vineyardboise.org slash go. All right, streamers, comfy up on your couch. And if you're in the sanctuary, I know there are people you haven't seen in a while, but you can also talk after the service. <laughs> this officially concludes our announcements for today. Be safe and be blessed. Hey, welcome back. Am I on here? There we go. Welcome back. Um, it's good to be here, wherever you're gathered. Um, it's, been a, it's been a different season. Um, you know, for the last three months or so, this room is, has been dark with, uh, with a few of us here, and no, um, there hasn't been any PA, there's been no video, and it's, 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 um, it's cool to be back with people. And, and um, for those of you who are able to gather at home, I'm also grateful that in the midst of of uh, times where people are, are not able to gather with others, that there's health reasons and whatnot that you need to be at home. I'm glad that we have the opportunity. So, so thankful for our team. You know, we have a team that's worked really hard throughout this season to continue to make uh, worship available, to make our gathering available. It's looked different. It's been a, a different normal, and our team's worked really hard. And so um, just this, mor- this morning as I was over with my family worshiping and just um, appreciating our, our worship team and the media team, especially they've taken, uh, they've taken a, a lot of time and put a lot of human resources and energy into uh, just making this possible. So thank you. Um, so you saw in the announcement video that we are, in fact, doing movie nights. We, we had planned back last fall when we started our... Um, you know, our, our calendar planning for this year before we knew anything that was going to be happening. We'd planned for three movie nights uh, for the summer, one for June, July, and August. And uh, of course, all this happened, and we've sort of have been holding those with an open hand like everything else. And as it turns out, um, you know, we're, we're, Idaho is currently, we're now in, in stage four of the reopening, and uh, larger gatherings are allowed, and especially outdoor gatherings are, are accessible. And our model for movie nights is actually something that's actually really um, conducive to the time in which we live. We've got plenty of space for people to social distance. Um, so we've got to, we do have to change some things. We're going to change the way we do concessions and be very aware of, uh, of some of those things in order to keep uh, kind of a safe protocol and not contribute to uh, another spike in the coronavirus. But, um, but we reached out to our mayor, the mayor of, of Garden City specifically, and asked him, I said, you know, is this something that you'd like us to do? We don't want to be in any way, um, uh, we don't want to be harming the city in any way or perceived as being adversarial in, in some sort of way. And he said, no, please, please do this. Um, because this, this is what people need. People need, as we, um, as we are, are emerging from homes and quarantine, we need opportunities to be with other people, but to do it in a safe way. And the fact that we can do this for free for the city is an amazing gift. So um, that's what we're doing. Um, the movie there for, this, for June, it's, it's Toy Story 4. I think in July, the plan is for Up. And then in August, it's going to be the movie Doolittle. 
Uh, so it's a great lineup. We're actually pretty excited about those. And, and just a reminder, if you're new to this, um, this is not the church throwing a movie party. It's not the staff throwing a movie party for the church. It's our church throwing a movie party for the city. It's a gift that we give to the city in a way th- that brings people together. And you know, our campus is not, it's not a shrine and it's not uh, something that we protect from other people. It's actually a place where we get to invite people into and to, to serve from, to minister from. So for us to throw a party right now for the city and to do it in a way that's, that's safe is going to be a great gift. So uh, we do need some volunteers, especially things for, you know, helping set up and tear down afterwards and also for concessions. So um, if you go to the vineyardboise.org slash go, uh, we can sign you up there. So um, so this is when we receive our morning offering. You may have noticed some new norms. Um, uh, we've actually talked for a long time as a church, like, is there a way that we can get away from passing the bucket around? It just seems like kind of a dated model, and it's awkward for people, and it's, um, there's just a number of reasons where we've talked about not doing that, but it was just such a habit. It was the way that we do things. We thought, we don't really know how to, to, to you know, change something that we've been doing for at that point, 30 years. And, um, and this whole interruption has given us a chance to do things a little bit differently. So we're going to put up our offering slide. This is um, some various ways you can give. If you're joining on campus, if you're in the room this morning, there are uh, offering uh, kind of boxes in between both sets of doors. So as you come in or as you leave the room, uh, you can always uh, put your offering there. Those are locked, um, but we do have accountants who have the keys. So, um, so you can drop your offering in there, and then the offering envelopes, rather than spreading them out on tables or, or on all the chairs, they're now on the poles in the room, so you can see those if you need an offering envelope to, to put um, your offering in and designate it. Uh, they're, they're there, and they're also on the back as well. So um, however you give, we appreciate it. As a church, you've been very faithful in the midst of this time. We didn't know what to expect in terms of how um, how this whole quarantine would impact us and if it would cause us to need to, to, to shut down uh, significant parts of what we do. And, um, and you guys have been faithful, and so we very much appreciate that um, because we get together to keep... Uh, what a time for us to be uh, reaching out with God's love to the city, to the valley, to the world. And we don't want to pull back. Now's the time for us to push forward. So um, there you go. So... Um, I'm going to pray in a minute. I always pray to start our service, but I'm going to do it in just a minute because first of all, I want to start with a little bit of an illustration here. So uh, there's a book that was written several years ago. Uh, I don't remember how long ago. It was written by a a Christian author named John Acuff. It was called Stuff Christians Like. It was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, maybe a lot tongue-in-cheek. I mean, you guys see that one? Thanks, Mitchell. Um, On this board, this is not Stuff Christians Like, it's Stuff Christians Say. Okay? Stuff Christians say. This is, this is going to be a little bit painful. Ready? All right. Thank you, Joe. Oh. Just throw it over the back. Just throw it over the back. There we go. Um, these are things that Christians say. Often... Uh, and these are often said sincerely and out of a desire to be helpful to people. Um, you know, it's possible to, to be sincere and also to be sincerely wrong. Because here's what I want to clarify. These are things that Christians say. I've, I've said some of these at different times. Um, these are not things that Jesus said. These are, there's no verses for these quotes, although we say them with that sort of authority at times. Uh, we say them as if, as if they're just biblical truisms that everybody knows. And actually, and, and, and you know, in each one of them, there's a, there's a hint of truth, some more, some less. But um, you don't need to write these down, by the way. These, uh, that's not the point. The point is that sometimes there's things that we believe, sometimes there's things we say, sometimes th- things we repeat, and they actually do more harm than good. And, and sometimes what we need to do is to take a, be willing to take a fresh look at what we believe, what we think, and allow God to, to change that and to shape that. And so here's what I want to do. Um, I need a, a volunteer, a young volunteer, someone maybe between the ages of, let's say, 8 and 12, and you have to be a, a somewhat of a tall volunteer, Joe. 
Right back here. Would you come on up? We'll have a few more volunteers this morning. What's your name? Graham. Graham. Whoa, sorry. Graham, uh, how did you finish school this year? Um, I finished a really long time ago. A really long time ago? <laughs> did you graduate already? Uh, graduate what? High school? No. Okay, good. In your school, have you ever had to erase the chalkboard? Is that just a thing from like the 80s? Or? I don't use chalkboard. I didn't think so. <laughs> See, this is one of those technological things that I figured was probably somewhat irrelevant. Are, do you understand the concept though, right? Of how to erase a chalkboard? See, you're a smart guy. I could tell this about you. So Graham, here's what I want you to do. You're going to do us a favor. You're going to illustrate that these, these things that we say or believe can be let go of. There's things that we can erase, right? So, so, Graham, if you would take this and just go ahead and erase everything on there, that would be really, really helpful. Ah, oh, doesn't that feel good? Thank you, Graham. <laughs> As he's doing that, let me say this. Here's, here's why I bring this up. We're going to spend the next three months, we're going to spend this whole summer uh, listening to the actual words of Jesus. We're going to listen to stuff that Jesus said. And, uh, and we're going to try and hear it the way that he intended it. There's times where, where Jesus says things and we've taken that and we've run a direction that he never intended. And so we're going to spend some time just soaking in Jesus' words. It's three chapters, Matthew 5 through 7. We're going to be, they're all red letters. Graham, thank you. You are a good man. We're done. You, yeah, you're done. Um, we're going to listen to Jesus' words. The, 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 as I was you know, reading my Bible, my Bible is one of those red-letter version where the things that Jesus said are actually put in red so that they're highlighted. I always write with a red pen because that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus wrote red. <laughs> so it annoys people. They think I'm correcting them. I'm not. I'm just like doing what Jesus did. So I look at these Matthew 5 through 7, and it's all red letters. And it's stuff that Jesus actually said. And I'm so grateful. This is, this is uh, something we've been talking about for a little bit of time now. And as I'm watching what's happening in our world, as I'm watching what's going on in the world around us in so many different platforms, so many environments, I think we really need to hear the words of Jesus. I think the whole world needs to hear the words of Jesus. And I think the church needs to hear the words of Jesus. Let me say this, and I, I hope you hear this. We need to be shaped, changed, challenged by the words of Jesus. Right now, I, I, I fear that the whole world and Christians specifically are oftentimes more shaped by our political party, our affiliation, or by our news source. And we spend more time reading the news and, and, and confirming the way that we see things than we do letting Jesus speak into our world, speak into us so that we can speak into the world. And there's things that are happening right now in our culture, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them this morning. We're, we're going to go there. But there's things that are happening in our, our culture and world that desperately need Jesus' people to move out in love and in healing and, and, and to move out with his heart. And oftentimes, Christians are sincerely disagreeing on these things. And it's not because we're listening to the words of Jesus. It's because we're listening to our news source. And so on the front end of this series, if, uh, I'd like us to, to, to consider this blank slate. And can we all come in humility and admit that there's things that we might be sincerely wrong about? Things that we've even thought, well, that's, that's what Jesus thinks, right? That's, that's, just, that's, that's, we've just, that's just the way things are. And maybe we've been wrong on some things. I'm confident that every one of us, myself included, have been wrong on some things. And so I'm, I'm so grateful. Like there's something in me that's longing to just let Jesus speak into these things. Some of the words he's going to say are going to be hard words to hear because they are so different than our culture. But they're words of life. We get to see this morning that Jesus didn't come to, to shame people. He came to, to bring words of life. So I'm going to open in prayer. And I just want to dedicate this next three months, this series, to God. 
to ask him, you know, we, we often talk about the, the uh, d- various manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We say, we, we give you an unqualified yes to every manifestation of your presence. We think about all the things that Jesus said, the promises he made about the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we think, okay, we want, we want all those things. One of the things that, that the Holy Spirit does is renders our hearts, takes the idolatry out of our hearts. Sometimes idols are the things that we believe that we shouldn't believe. They're untrue things about God. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is teaches us to know the Father. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is empowers us to move out into the world with his presence, with his love. And so this is a come Holy Spirit moment. Will you give us the grace? Will you give us the, the, the grace to open our hearts and open our minds and let you speak and shape us? So if you join with me in that prayer, I think this is a prayer of anticipatory repentance. I think there's things we need to repent of. Will we allow God to do that? Will we allow us to soften our hearts, to change our minds? It's a prayer of welcome. It's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of entrusting ourselves to the living God. So Holy Spirit, we do welcome you, even as we've, we've sung this morning and we've prayerfully, uh, melodically opened our hearts to you and said, come Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We welcome this manifestation of your presence. We ask for the transformation of our minds. We ask for the uh, shaping of our hearts. That as we move out into the world around us, we would do so as people who carry your image. Heavenly Father, where we've distorted your image or where we've failed to, to reflect you as you are, would you bring conviction to us through this series? Lord, not, not for the purpose of, of shaming or condemning us, but for the purpose of restoring us speaking life into us and speaking life through us. Or would you, would you clean the slate? May we come to you with, an, with uh, a clean slate, with open minds, with open hearts. And the things that we've believed about, even the, the words that we're going to be reading, may we hear them as you intended. And in any place where we've distorted that or we've misunderstood it, would you bring clarity to us? Would you ask for a spirit of revelation to, to, to fall on this church wherever we're gathered? Ask for a spirit of humility to be willing to listen to you. And we ask that you would speak, that you would touch, that you would heal. Would you send us out into a world that that desperately needs you? We ask these things in your name for your glory and for our abundant life and for the sake of our world. Amen. All right, today we're going to be in the the very first part of um, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew 5 through 7. And... um, we're going to start with actually, so Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to actually go back to chapter 4 and look at the introduction because, uh, b- because Matthew's introduction, um, or Matthew includes an introduction to Jesus' public ministry. So this, this little verse is really important, Matthew 4, 17. It says, from that time on, and this is b- the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He's, he's been baptized. He's gone through a, or by, by John in the Jordan. He's, uh, he's experienced a time of temptation in the wilderness. And now he's entering into public ministry empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it says this, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, that little statement, we're going to spend a little bit of time here. We're going to camp here for just a minute because that statement sets up everything we're going to read. When we read the, these, these three chapters, that's the summary of what's happening. Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God. He's saying it has come near, so you should do something about it. You should repent. So what does that mean? There's three parts. We're going to look at, first of all, what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Sometimes we talk about the kingdom of God. Matthew generally calls it the kingdom of heaven, so those two things are kind of interchangeable. 
But the kingdom of heaven is this. It's the active will of God breaking into our human experience. The kingdom of heaven is what our world would look like, what our lives would look like, if God's will was what always was done right here on earth. Remember Jesus said, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. He, kingdom and will, he brought those two things together. He said, here on earth as it is in heaven. So, so the kingdom, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, it's not a place. You, we can talk about the United Kingdom. It's over there on the other side of the pond. That's a place that's a kingdom. We're not talking about a place. We're talking about God's will breaking in wherever we are. In homes, in cafes, in workplaces, in schools, in church campuses. It's not a place, it's the kingdom of God. It's the rule of God. It's not a people. We can also talk about, sometimes we talk about a kingdom as if it's the the people that, that are under a certain king. But the church is not the kingdom of God. The church is, the church, we're, we're a people who welcome the kingdom of God, who ask for the kingdom of God to advance in us and through us. But we're not the kingdom. The kingdom is God's active will breaking in. So that's what the crowd, that we're, there's going to be a crowd that's listening to Jesus. The original time when he taught this message, this, when he spoke all of these words, there was a crowd listening. That's what they understood. And that's what they were longing for. They were watching for that. So here we've depicted their expectation with this simple graph illustration. You see there, there's, there's this black dot there on the bottom left that, that reflects the beginning of mankind or human history. And it starts with a little white dot because when God first created mankind, there was no sin, no rebellion. We were under God's good rule and reign. The kingdom of God was here on earth and it was altogether good. And then our first parents rejected God and they said, no, we will rule ourselves. And then, and then darkness was introduced to all of the good creation. Creation was subjected to the rule of Satan at that point. And so they're moving forward. It's like a timeline and everything moving forward is black because this age is now characterized by the results and by the consequences of that rebellion. So just think about all the things we experience, the things that are circulating in the news, the things we we read about, hear about, grieve. Sickness, cancer, death, violence, greed, selfishness, hoarding, hunger, poverty, loneliness, depression, addiction, people using and abusing one another, human trafficking, Novel and deadly viruses, pandemics, racism, when evil seems to prosper. So all of those things that have plagued mankind ever since the garden, that's that's the, the world we live in. That's this age. And so what the people of God were longing for was a time when God would intervene, when the creator would come back and restore his creation. And God had promised over and over through the, the prophets that there was a coming day of the Lord, a, a time of intervention when God would intervene and set them free from those things. When God's rule would be reestablished over his creation. Creation would be restored. The works of the enemy would be destroyed. All things would be made new. Basically what people were longing for is they looked at the world around them and they were longing for evil to be conquered and God's good creation to be restored. So that's the expectation that's in the minds of Jesus' uh, listeners as he, as he spoke. So second part of that phrase, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the active rule and reign of God has come near. Has come near. So, so what does that mean? That means it's close. It's accessible. It's available. It's breaking in. These are the things that, that, that everybody's been longing for that have been promised at that point for, for hundreds and hundreds of years They've been waiting for, and Jesus said, it's here. It's finally here. It's time. What he's not saying, he's not saying the kingdom of God is coming into existence. That's why in that graph, that there's this white line that's the kingdom of God. It doesn't start, have a starting point. It just, it just, it just, it's eternal. It's always there. But it's breaking into the human reality. So he's not saying it's coming into existence, but that it can finally be entered into. It can be experienced. That what God intended at the time of creation is now being restored. Which here's what this means. This is why this is so important because this is going to shape the way that we listen to what Jesus has to say in Matthew 5 through 7. He's not talking about a distant time or reality. He's not talking about life on the other side of this world. He's not talking about what happens to us when we die. And the danger in our world is because when we think of heaven, we think of, well, that's the space on the other side of, of this life. 
And so we can think about everything he's saying seems sort of irrelevant to this life. He's talking about what happens when we die. And Jesus does care about what happens when we die. And he also cares very much about this life. We're going to see that this morning. He's talking about life right now. Again, it's on earth as it is in heaven. So that brings us to point three, which is the the action. What should people do? Jesus said, from that time, Jesus began to preach, repent. So what's this word repent? What does that mean? When I think of the word repent, what do you think of? Asking for forgiveness. We don't use the word repent a whole lot in our culture outside of church. As you experience the word repent, I think of the kind of wild-eyed prophet standing on a street corner, maybe with a sign and a bullhorn, and he's shouting at people and he's saying, repent, the wrath of God is coming. And, and, and what do people do? Joy. Run. Avoid him, right? That guy, the, the guy in the corner, that's the most empty corner downtown. Everybody is going completely around him, giving him as much space as possible, right? I want you to see that, that the way that Jesus used repent didn't create that sort of a response. People were actually running to him. He was saying, repent, and it wasn't repelling them. They were running to him. Jesus was saying, turn your life towards this new reality. It's finally open. You've been waiting for it, longing for it, and now it's here. Turn into it. With your whole life, turn into this. Lean into it. Seize this opportunity. Take action. Jump in. There's all kinds of ways we can say it. Act now. That's the thing. It's here. It's available. Do something. Get in. Again, this repentance was not driven by fear of punishment, by good news, but by good news of abundant life. News that was too good to be true. So look at these next verses. That's, that's one summary that's in chapter 4 before we get into the, the unpacking, what that looked like. These next verses show that this was good news that they didn't just hear. They didn't just hear Jesus talking about good news. They got to see it. They got to experience it. Listen to this. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogue. So he was talking about this. Proclaiming the good news. That's really important. The good news of the kingdom. He was healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed. And he healed them. And so large crowds from Galilee, from the Decapolis, from Jerusalem, and the whole region across the Jordan, they followed him. You hear his message. His message is, repent. The kingdom of God has come upon you. It's near. It's available. And people were running because they were experiencing it. They were seeing it. They were seeing their lives changed. I need three more volunteers this morning. Young people volunteers. We're leaning into the fact that we have kids in this room. And we're not just going to tolerate that. We're going to embrace it. It's a good thing. All right? We're glad the kids are here. So, um, Marshall, Olivia, and Hudson, would you guys come and just sit on the edge of this, on the edge of this stage here for a second? Hudson, show them your sign. What, what does it say? I'm jobless, homeless, and broken. Anything helps. God bless. It always, the signs always say God bless, right? Yes. Always say God bless. So, and clearly, here's the thing about the signs. They're always saying God will bless you if you help me, but clearly the person holding the sign is not experiencing God's blessing. I mean, clearly, I mean, that's, that's the idea. If they were experiencing God's blessing, they wouldn't be holding the sign. This, this, this passage we just read, Jesus just came to each one of these people. And he dealt with whatever the brokenness of this world looked like in their life. People were coming with every disease, every sickness, every illness, every expression of pain in a fallen world. Whatever it was for them, he, he dealt with it. So he, when he said, the kingdom of God has come near, he didn't say, someday you're going to experience goodness. He brought it to their, their pain right now. And so let's do this. I want all three of you to think, if Jesus healed you, what would that action look like? What would, so what would you do with your glasses that represent blindness if you, if you were healed and you could suddenly see? What would you do, Marshall? Would you take the glasses off? 
And would you look around and wonder, look at this amazing world. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> yeah. And Olivia, what would you do with your cane? You wouldn't use it for walking, would you? No, maybe it'd be a dancing prop. Yeah. You drop it. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. That's awesome, Olivia. And Hudson, if, if Jesus touched you and he brought abundance into your life and he healed the places where you were broken and abandoned and all of that, would you need your sign anymore? What would you do with it? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. All right. Now, here's what I need you guys to do. I'm going to let you go back to your parents in just a second and sit down. But first, I need you to sit here because when Jesus begins this sermon, these people are in the crowd. When he starts talking about the goodness of the kingdom of God breaking into people's lives, there's, there's examples that people can see. Either they've experienced it themselves or they witnessed it. The person they brought that needed Jesus' touch got healed. And so that's why they're flocking to Jesus, because he can make a difference in the pain of this world. And so, so while you hear the, the Beatitudes, we're just going to read the first 12 verses. These are called the Beatitudes. I want you to realize that as Jesus is talking about this, the crowd that's listening, they can look at, this has actually happened. Jesus has their attention. So he says, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. So he's gone, he's gone far enough that the people who followed him, hey, they have to, to want to be with him. Okay? They may not be committed disciples yet. They may be just curious. Is this the Messiah? But they're longing for more. They've, they've shifted a position from being passive spectators to being active listeners. They want to hear, is this the person that we've been waiting for? Is this the one that really could make a difference in this world? Could this person bring God's redemption into our broken world? And so they come and they're listening. And Jesus begins the good news about the nearness of God's kingdom. It's near, it's broken in. 5.2, he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are Jesus' words. All right. Everybody, would you give it up for Marshall and Hudson Olivia? You guys can go back to your, go back to your families. <laughs> Too much. All right, you guys can go back to your families now. Thanks. Bob Ross. <laughs> All right, so this week what we're going to do is we're going to zero, or next week, we're doing, we're doing the Beatitudes. The, the, what we just read, that's called the Beatitudes. We're going to do those in two parts. Okay, so next week we're going to jump into the specifics of those 10, or actually nine things that Jesus said. Today, we're just going to talk about the big picture of what those things mean and also what they don't mean. And what I'd suggest to you is there's, there's ways we've understood what Jesus just said that could go up on the board of things Christians say, stuff Christians say, that actually needs to be let go of. It needs to be erased, and we need to hear it with fresh ears. But first of all, what are the Beatitudes? Well, they're not a list of how to merit, earn, or qualify for going to heaven. A lot of times that's the way we've understood them in our Western church. I don't think that's the way that Jesus' first audience understood him. How do we know that they're not those things? How do we know it's not just a list of how to merit getting into heaven when we die? Well, first of all, there's a time element. Did Jesus ever say anything about, about this being only for the distant future? 
No, he's actually saying, repent. The kingdom of God has come near. It's right now. The thing he said about the time element is it's available now. Does it stretch into eternity? Absolutely. But it doesn't start then. It starts right now. What they've seen is they, as Jesus has healed different people is they've seen the inbreaking kingdom down payments of God's complete redemption. Installments. It's not complete yet. They're still, they're, they can still look around and they can see there's still a lot of brokenness in this world, but they're seeing down payments of what's to come. Installments. It's breaking through in people's lives. Little gracelets. We know it's good news because people were acting like it was good news. If this was a list of how to earn or qualify for heaven, and listen to this carefully, if this was a list on how to qualify for heaven, this would not be good news. Matthew told us it was good news. People were acting like it was good news. They were running to him. But if this was a list of what you have to do to get into heaven, this would not be good news. Think about it. You know what? If you just become spiritually bankrupt, then you get into heaven. Now, we've tried to understand what does poor in spirit mean, and, we, and a lot of times we've tried to say, well, you have to understand that you have nothing to offer God. And, and that's, that is true. But that's not what Jesus said. If he wanted to say that, he could have said it that way. He said spiritual bankruptcy. Spiritually obtuse. Ignorant. <laughs> he could have said, if this was a list of how to get into heaven, then he would be saying, well, just hope that something happens in your life where you have to mourn. You may have it really good now, but hope that something happens where, where you become those people who mourn. Because it's those who mourn that get comforted with heaven. Strive to be persecuted. Strive to be despised, slandered, falsely accused. That's who heaven's for. Is that good news? No, does anybody want to live like that? Now, there are some things he says that are, are desirable characteristics. But when you take the list at whole, he's not saying do these things so that you qualify for the kingdom of God. Secondly, what he's not saying, while some of these characteristics described are consistent with godly character, the list as a whole cannot be conditions to aspire to in order to please God and to merit his favor. There are things, there's characteristics that are desirable for, for Christ-like character. Being merciful, being pure in heart, peacemakers. Those are things that we, that we do long for those characters, we, or we expect those characteristics to be growing in a disciple of Jesus. But there's other parts that would be confusing. Again, try to be spiritually bankrupt and illiterate, or even financially poor. Is there any hope for us if we've, if we've you know, done well and have good resources? Just try to grieve more, just try to be persecuted, try to be slandered. And here's the, here's the trick. If you try to be persecuted, then you're doing it for the wrong reason and you're, and you're meriting it and now, you're, and now you just messed everything up. So then what are the Beatitudes? What's Jesus doing here? What they are is surprising statements about the unexpected availability and the nature of the kingdom of heavens. They're surprising twists on who this good life is for and how to enter into it. There's a theme that you heard nine times. What was the what was the repeated word? Blessed. Blessed. This is this is this is the good life. This is a life where you're where you're you're experiencing all the abundance. Jesus came, he said, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Sometimes in scripture we talk about fullness of life. That's that's the blessed life. Jesus is saying. It's surprisingly available in circumstances where you'd never expect it. A surprising twist. The condition of those who experience this, this kingdom life is that of being blessed. And he gives, he gives nine examples, and they, they break down into three basic categories, as I can see it. There's reversals of fortune. And here's the surprise, that those who mourn are comforted. Those who are oppressed, those who are grieved, they receive relief. They receive comfort. They receive restoration. Reversals of fortune. There's unexpected twists on the human economy and experience. We look around about just the way that things work. And Jesus says in the kingdom of God, it's different. For example, the poor in spirit are at home in the kingdom. They're not just, it's not just for the spiritually elite. It's not just for the theologically informed. It's not just for the morally upstanding. It's for the spiritually bankrupt are welcomed in the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus can point to people in his audience. 
the meek inherit the earth. That's the, is that the way it works in a human economy? Do the meek inherit the earth? Huh. How, how do you gain power and, and advantage? It's through political power. It's through personal influence. It's through military force. And Jesus says, not the kingdom of heaven. It's very different. There's an unexpected twist. It's actually through meekness. The merciful will receive mercy. In the kingdom of heaven, the merciful will receive mercy. In the kingdom of man, what do merciful receive? They get stomped on. If you're weak, if you're, if you're merciful, you become a carpet that people walk on. You get taken advantage of. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, the merciful receive mercy. In the kingdom of heaven, the persecuted and the outcast for righteousness' sake will be at home. Those who are outcasts will be at home in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, when you're persecuted, when you're falsely accused and slandered, you can rejoice with confidence that there's many who've gone before you. There's an eternal heritage which can be taken away. There is an eternal aspect. Don't, don't get me wrong. These beatitudes, there's an eternal promise attached to them. It's just that it's not waiting for death. It starts now. And lastly, there's promises of deep longings that are satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. The pure in heart will see God. Big picture, let me just pull back big picture. What are these statements, the Beatitudes? They, the sta- they're statements about blessing they're, that are not a reward for the condition described. It's not a reward for being spiritually bankrupt, for being spiritually obtuse. It's not a reward for being persecuted. It's a surprising abundance of blessing in spite of those conditions. So you think about the, the, the key, there's a, there's a sentence structure thing that happens there, like, blessed are you for, is the for saying that you're earning it through that, or is it saying that even if? And it's more like even if. Even the poor in spirit have the kingdom of heaven. It's available, it's radically open. Act now, the time has come. This was an, a complete unexpected of upheaval of their worldview, of the way that things just are. Things that, they, things that they believe about, just well, this is just the way the world works, just got challenged when he says the kingdom of heaven is breaking in and it's very different than the human economy. So I think the good question for us to ask, and maybe, so if you're, if you're joining from, from a home platform, this would be a good conversation to have this afternoon, maybe around lunch. But two questions. Who do you think of as blessed and alternatively, who do you think of as deserving pity? This is the human economy. This is what Jesus is changing. Jesus is reframing everything for them. Who do you think of as blessed? It's a good conversation for us to have in here as well. Who in your estimation is set up to have a good life now? What individuals, what social groups, what economic classes, what citizens of what nations, what racial groups? What genders? Who do you think of has it easy? Has it good? This week I was out for a walk. I was, I was praying about this actual passage. I was out for a walk in a pretty nice neighborhood. And it was a Thursday morning, so there was people getting ready for the weekend. I saw three different guys getting their RVs ready. One guy, I was, I was walking past his house. He had his SUV hooked up to this really nice trailer. And it just, like, it just, I had this picture of what life was like for him this weekend. I thought, I wonder, where, I wonder where he's going camping. He had his dog with me. He had this big golden doodle sitting next to him. And the dog was excited because they were going on a road trip. And I could tell his family was inside waiting. I wondered, like, what, what meals, what, what great food and beverage has he stocked his camper with? Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? That's a picture of the good life, right? I thought, man, he, I said to him as I walked past him, I was like, well, looks like you're going to have a good weekend. That to me spoke of a blessed life and just a very, from a very human economy. What speaks to you of that? What speaks to you of, on the other side of what deserves pity? What people or groups are spiritually hopeless? And I want you to think about this because Jesus wasn't just dealing with physical poverty, he was dealing with spiritual poverty. Who do you think is spiritually Hopeless. What groups, what individuals, what people in your life? Jesus says the kingdom is radically open to them. Over whom would you shake your head and sigh? 
Sometimes that's all we do. Sometimes we see the signs and we just think, oh man, that's, that's sad. Jesus said the kingdom of God is breaking in right now. Jesus showed that the blessedness of the kingdom was both now and it was also to come. He talked about it now. He showed that it was now. And he also talked about it in a way that was future. We'll talk more about that. About the, we, we showed that, that illustration of, of what they were expecting. And the, the, the first Christians, the early Christians, had to a, adapt their understanding of what it looked like for the kingdom of God to break in. They realized it wasn't just going to be in one decisive moment, that it was going to be over a period of time. That the kingdom of God was breaking in, but it was going to happen in two events, the, the first coming and the second coming. So we live in between those two where the kingdom of God is breaking in and the kingdom of this world is still very present. So we have dark arrows and light arrows. Jesus said, it's happening now. It's starting now. Act on it. Jesus was healing every disease. He was healing every affliction. And he also said, stuff in the future tense, sh- they shall be comforted. You will inherit. You will be satisfied. So I'm going to close with this This. Uh, Summary statement. This is, a, this is from uh, author Dallas Willard. I think, in my opinion, Dallas Willard wrote the kind of the defining understanding of this whole Matthew 5 through 7. Um, I know it's been very shaping for me in my Christian life. And so I, I can't, my, my own theology and understanding of God's kingdom would be much the poorer without Dallas Willard. So here's, here's one statement he said. So this is his summary. Now, the Beatitudes, he says, no one is actually being told that they are better off for being poor, for mourning, or for being persecuted, and so on, or that the conditions listed are recommended ways of well-being before God or man. Nor are the Beatitudes indications of who will be at top, on the top after the revolution. Not just flipping the, the, the switch. What they are is explanations, illustrations, drawn from the immediate setting of the present availability of the kingdom, and here's, what, here's the key part, through personal relationship to Jesus. They singled out cases that provide proof that in Jesus, the rule of God from the heavens truly is available in life circumstances that are beyond all human hope. Don't you love that it said, Matthew, when he's talking about this, he said, every sickness Every illness, whatever the brokenness of this world looked like to people, they were bringing them to Jesus. And the good news is repentance didn't mean that he was pushing them away or shaming them, but that he was bringing healing to the very circumstances of their life. Our worship team's gonna come and just lead us in a song of invitation. And whether you're gathering at home, whether you're gathering here on campus. I want to ask you, what, is, what does it look like for you to open yourself to the kingdom of God? Same, the same message that Jesus spoke some 2,000 years ago is actually the same message today. The kingdom of God has come near. Act. What's it look like to act on it? What do, what do you need to ask for? We have a prayer team this morning that some, we have prayer, people that can pray for, for you if you're gathering online. We have people that can pray for you if you're gathering here in the room. But we're going to ask for the kingdom of God to break in today. We're asking for physical healing. We're asking for spiritual healing. We're asking for those who've been outcasts, spiritual outcasts, to be brought into the family. We're asking for those who've been rejected by the church to be loved. This is a radical message. This is, there, there's, there's things that Jesus was undoing that religious people believed. I'm just gonna ask you to close your eyes, wherever you are. As the worship team just sings over us, what does it look like? kingdom of God breaks in both in us and through us, what would that look like? I think there's some 
some that are listening today, maybe you're listening live, maybe you're live streaming later or watching later, but you don't yet know if you can trust Jesus. You might be like those crowds that had seen, that you'd heard some good things, not quite sure if it's for you. And so you're drawing close to listen. This series is a chance to lean in. It's a chance to lean close to the words of Jesus and say, is it true? Is it, is it too good to be true? Jesus will he'll make himself known to us. Maybe you haven't yet entrusted your life to Jesus. It's hard to entrust ourselves to somebody that we don't know. There's a lot that's asked of us as Christians. There's, when we become followers of Jesus, there's lifestyle changes that we make that are actually for our best. They're for abundant life. They're for good. But it's hard to entrust those things, those, those parts of our life to somebody we don't know. The series is a chance to come to know Jesus in a deeper way, a way that, that enables us to entrust ourselves to him. So I'm going to invite you to lean in close in this series. Like those disciples that climbed the mountain to get close and hear what he had to say, do some climbing. Immerse yourself in this text. Be, we've got three months to be in these, in these red letters. Please be shaped by these more than your news source. Please be shaped by these words more than social media, Facebook, Instagram, more than just finding the people who agree with you and confirming, patting each other on the back. Let Jesus speak into our environment. There's nothing better than you. There's no
know, oftentimes these songs we sing, they can be prayers. They were prayed in faith. They, maybe they're not the, the reality of our existence yet completely, but we want them to be. Sometimes they speak the words of our heart that we want to be true. Maybe, maybe your life doesn't reflect that you truly believe that there's nothing better than him. But do you want that to be true? Do you, do you want to experience that? Beauty, beauty from ashes. What a perfect song. If you gathered this morning on the, on the live stream, if you need prayer, there's, there's ways to raise your hand and ask for prayer. Depending on which platform you're on, you should be able to see that. People would be glad to pray with you. If you're here this morning in the room, our prayer team is scattered around the room. And so if you'd like prayer, if you just raise your hand, um, I'd love to pray with you. Whatever, whatever it looks like for the, the abundance of God to address the brokenness of your situation, the longings for your heart, if you'd raise your hand, we'd send somebody over to pray with you. We've got a hand over here. going to close us in prayer. I just want to commit this series to Jesus and ask him to write these words on our hearts. Write them on our hearts, write them on our minds to become the, the words that we live from. So Jesus, we do welcome every manifestation of your presence. And Lord, we don't know the plans for what all you have for this corner of your pasture for the things that you have for us, but we know who it is that is our great shepherd. And so that's, we give a yes to you, not, not necessarily to plans, because we don't know what the plans are, but, but if the plans come from you, we trust you. We trust you with the plans for each one of our lives and for our life together. And so as we open this series, as we open ourselves to your words, would you speak to us? Would you shape us? Would you commission us and empower us and send us? Would you awaken us, heal us, transform us, empower us? May your words be life. May our lives reflect your abundance and your goodness. And we move out into this world with your mercy, with your kindness, with your love, with your compassion, with your healing, with your restoration. So we entrust ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to pursue prayer and conversation. And um, we'll be here again next week gathering on campus, gathering in homes. There is more space to gather on campus if you were wondering. We still have plenty of space with, with social distancing. So um, go make the invisible God visible. We want to be a part of your story. Thanks for watching. To respond or receive prayer after the live stream closes, please email prayer at vineyardboise.org. And if possible, include your phone number. We'd love to get in touch with you. Thanks.